You are listening to Episode 8 of the Casting Shadows Podcast. This podcast is linked inextricably. It is bound tightly and irrevocably to the Casting Shadows blog. You can find the blog, the written blog, at castingshadowsblog.com. This podcast you've already found, so you don't need to go looking for it. If you're interested in following along in a video format, you can check out youtube.com slash runeslinger. And these three methods of communication, the written blog, this podcast, and YouTube, are the primary ways that I share my thoughts and observations on role-playing games for the purpose of sharing our individual experience and trying to spark conversation about the ways that we play, about the different games that we play, and the different ways that we have tried playing them. There's thousands, thousands of games out there, each with some different way of doing something or even approaching the whole hobby completely. So there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot to learn from each other. And this is my small part of contributing to that. For lesser interactions, you can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash runeslinger and on Twitter at twitter.com slash runeslinger. So episode eight of the Casting Shadows blog, is following on from episode 7, which was called On Facilitating Fear, and which was meant as opening up a loosely related series of posts connected to the notion of fear in role-playing games for the characters, but also helping the players get into some kind of position in play where they can enjoy a little bit of, if nothing else, unease. This episode is going to look as a point of contrast at one RPG produced by Triple Ace Games and then compare that to two other RPGs also by Triple Ace Games. So we're primarily going to look in this episode at All for One, Regime Diabolique. And, briefly, we will compare it to Leagues of Gothic Horror, which is an expansion of Leagues of Adventure, and Leagues of Cthulhu, which is an expansion of Leagues of Gothic Horror. (laughs) So, we'll be looking at two overtly horror-themed games as a counterpoint to our main examination of All for One, which is a game which deeply involves supernatural horror, let's say, but yet does not involve role-playing mechanisms of fear. All for One, Regime Diablique, was released in 2010 under a license by Triple Ace Games from Exile Game Studio of the Ubiquity role-playing system, which first burst onto the scene behind Hollow Earth Expedition, and then later by Desolation by Gray Malkin Design Studio. Triple A's Games has probably been the most active and prolific of all the Ubiquity licensees, and games like All for One have benefited greatly from the talent of their lead writer and creative developer, Paul Wade Williams, affectionately known as Wiggy. With All for One, Regime Diabolique, 
Wiggy produced a world where the characters would be playing members of the Musketeers, whether the King's Musketeers or the Queen's Musketeers, it doesn't matter, but they would be playing Musketeers in France, likely in Paris, set in 1636. So after the time of the first Three Musketeers novel, but before the second, they would be expected to do the duties of musketeers. However, this is where things diverge, because in this version of France, the supernatural, the things and the superstitions that people from our world believed were true, well, in this game world, they are true. Demons wait for an opportunity to possess vampires, werewolves, ghosts. These things are real. And black magicians who make agreements with dark forces lurk and scheme, seeking to gain advantage. Secret societies and openly secret societies and dark and mysterious cults all vie for power in this dark and bleak version of France. A France ruled in a very real sense by fear. And what do I mean by that? I mean, when the sun goes down, the people hide inside. Everything that we believed used to go bump in the night actually does go bump in the night in this France. But our main characters, the musketeers, these particular people are cut from a different cloth than are the rest. And so while the rest of the country might be too afraid to protect the king or other officials from an assassin's bullet or an assassin's blade or a vile and cowardly dose of poison in a meal. These characters do. They rise up between those they are sworn to protect and those who would do them harm. They serve on the front lines of battle. They serve behind the lines. They serve unto death itself. And for pennies. Sometimes not paid at all. They serve because they have sworn to serve. These characters are larger than life and find themselves pitting their strength of arm and the quality of their steel versus threats they cannot possibly hope to defeat on their own. But therein lies the game's larger hook. All for one and one for all. It is a game of larger-than-life heroes. In contrast, Leagues of Gothic Horror offers a very different experience. Although utilizing the same game system, it utilizes it dialed to different settings and from different perspectives, adding in some new mechanics to reinforce its purpose. Leagues of Gothic Horror, where All for One is a very refined and focused experience of playing the types of characters I've just described, Leagues of Gothic Horror is a toolkit for Gothic Horror. Are you going to be plagued by visitations 
from ghosts or otherworldly spirits? Are you going to investigate the strange goings-on in your neighbor's tower where deep in the depths of night strange blue flashes of light flicker and mad cackles of a dark glee echo across the countryside? There are so many opportunities to define and redefine, to code and encode the broad palette of gothic horror in this game, it's hard to imagine ever finding its end. Where All for One is razor sharp and narrowly focused, gothic horror runs a broad, broad spectrum of options for play. And what do they have in common? These experiences have in common human frailty and human fear. Maybe fear that goes so far as to reach a sense of horror. In other words, moving from mortal peril to spiritual peril. In Gothic horror, it is possible for the character to become so tainted by exposure to evil and the forces of darkness that they become corrupt. And little by little, step by step, they can be dragged out of the light and into the darkness. The darkness which is used as a symbol of absence from the good and the blessed. <laughs> In Leagues of Gothic Horror, we have human antagonists and we have otherworldly antagonists. We have things from beyond the grave. We have things that were never born. We have the reanimated monster by magic or by unusual science. And all of these things threaten the life and the soul of the character, which firmly plants it in this gothic horror tradition. Each of the characters has been built with mechanics that govern reaction to fear and in some way affect one's ability to act in the face of fear and one's ongoing health, mental and otherwise, as play progresses. Going farther, going into Leagues of Cthulhu, we find ourselves beyond gothic horror and in cosmic horror. And the world, the universe, the setting that has been provided is far, far bleaker, filled with <laughs> far fewer assurances that some benevolent deity is out there waiting to receive us upon death. And so the the punishments of that inexorable decline into fear, corruption, and perhaps madness are far greater. Looking back at All for One, all of this is absent. The musketeers routinely face assassins, cultists, plotters, revolutionaries, the forces of darkness. And yet, there is no mechanical system in there to show the strain, the trauma, the gradual erosion of character in the face of fear and horror. What does this mean? And how can there be fear in a game which does not mechanize it. 
for the purpose of this podcast in fear, or perhaps it is horror that it will go on and on forever. I will make two suggestions for where this staunch bravery, this courage in the face of absolute horror could stem. Where can it come from? Suggestion number one is something like this, that we, the players, in acknowledgement of the source material, will agree to, and in fact embody in our play, the very substance, the rules of the genre that we are attempting to explore and enjoy. In other words, through the idiom of our play of musketeers in a supernatural France, we will bring out those qualities which make a musketeer different from the Cardinal's guards, which make a musketeer different from the croissant baker down the road. We will act in a manner befitting those particular people and not others. We recognize that our play is going to produce its own idiom inside the genre, if we're lucky, and outside the genre, if we're not. But, again, if we're lucky, we'll still have fun. However, if our intention is to portray these particular larger-than-life characters, and we are familiar with the source material, then operating within the social constraints suggested by the characters in the source material, we can find ourselves in situations requiring great heroics where normal people might, <laughs> believably and understandably, feel fear. And yet, in our memory, perhaps we don't remember the characters demonstrating fear. We can say to ourselves, ah, but Solomon Cain never felt fear. Or, you know, as we go through our our different lists of characters. You know, the Count of Monte Cristo, he didn't feel fear. But then I would have to ask you, is that precisely true? Perhaps we have forgotten small details of characters' behavior, such as Conan the Barbarian <laughs> screaming in fear and rage. Rage at the fear of the types of encounters he's staring down. Solomon Cain crying out in horror that evils such as he is sworn to fight exist, and yet he has come face to face with another one, and his rage, his desire to punish, goes hand in hand with his fear. He's able to act even though the fear is riding with him. And the same might be true of our musketeers. And yet, so as to do no dishonor to their compatriots and to the king to whom they have sworn utter loyalty, they give no voice to their fear. They are gallant in the face of peril. And yet, what happens after the battles are over? What happens when they are off duty? They are told they must dress well. They must represent the king in all things. They must walk with swagger. They must brook no insult from anyone. They must be seen to be charismatic, charming, and the desire of everyone. And where do we find the musketeers, night after night, when they are off duty, we find them drinking themselves into a stupor. We find them embroiled in meaningless flirtations 
affairs and relationships. And why? And what does this remind us of? And so, as the behavior of these types of characters is portrayed in the source material, this debauchery, this memory erasing behavior, which covers over the trauma and makes them look even more virile, but is really hiding the effects of fear and shock and loss. It's an interesting perspective, I think, and it adds depth to a game like All for One when we consider how we must portray the characters boldly and bravely flying into the face of dangers they know can destroy them with a smile on their lips feigning a song in their hearts and that after it's all over they will fight desperately tooth and claw in the exact same way but on a more private battlefield to keep themselves together because that is what they do. A second perspective we will draw from chapter 5 of The Three Musketeers. The King's Musketeers and the Cardinal's Guards. And see if you can predict where I'm going by the time we get there. D'Artagnan was acquainted with nobody in Paris. He went, therefore, to his appointment with Athos without a second, determined to be satisfied with those his adversary should choose. So what scene is this? This is after young D'Artagnan, having arrived in Paris, as it says, knowing nobody, not even having a second for a duel. He has managed to offend Athos, and Porthos, and Aramis, not realizing that these three are friends, not knowing even who they are. And he has arranged to have one duel after, the, after another over a three-hour span. Right, so this, this famous scene in the book, how could this possibly happen? His intention was formed to make the brave musketeer all suitable apologies, but without meanness or weakness, fearing that might result from this duel which generally results from an affair of this kind, when a young and vigorous man fights with an adversary who is wounded and weakened. If conquered, he doubles the triumph of his antagonist. If a conqueror, he is accused of foul play and want of courage. Now, we must have badly painted the character of our adventure seeker, or our readers must have already perceived that D'Artagnan was not an ordinary man. Therefore, while repeating to himself that his death was inevitable, he did not make up his mind to die quietly, as one less courageous and less restrained might have done in his place. He reflected upon the different characters of those with whom he was going to fight, and began to view his situation more clearly. He hoped, by means of loyal excuses, to make a friend of Athos, whose lordly air and austere bearing pleased him much. He flattered himself that he should be able to frighten Porthos with the adventure of the baldric, which he might, if not killed upon the spot, relate to everybody, a recital which, well managed, would cover Porthos with ridicule. As to the astute Aramis, he did not entertain much dread of him, and supposing he should be able to get so far, he determined to dispatch him in good style, or at least by hitting him in the face, as Caesar recommended his soldiers do to those of Pompey to damage forever the beauty of which he was so proud. In addition to this, D'Artagnan possessed that invincible stock of resolution which the counsels of his father had implanted in his heart. Endure nothing from anyone but the king, the cardinal, and Monsieur de Trevis. He flew then, rather than walked, toward the convent of the Comme des Chaux, or rather des Chaux, as it was called at that period, a sort of building without a window, surrounded by barren fields, an accessory to the place which was generally employed as the place for the duels of men who had no time to lose. 
When D'Artagnan arrived in sight of the bare spot of ground which extended along the foot of the monastery, Athos had been waiting about five minutes, and twelve o'clock was striking. He was, then, as punctual as the Samaritan woman, and the most rigorous casuist with regard to duels could have nothing to say. Athos, who still suffered grievously from his wound, though it had been dressed in anew by M. de Trevis' surgeon, was seated on a post and waiting for his adversary with hat in hand, his feather even touching the ground. Monsieur, said Athos, I have engaged two of my friends as seconds, but these two friends are not yet come, at which I am astonished, that is, it is not at all their custom. I have no seconds on my part, monsieur, said D'Artagnan, for having only arrived yesterday in Paris, I as yet know no one but Monsieur de Treville, to whom I was recommended by my father, who has the honor to be, in some degree, one of his friends. Athos reflected for an instant. You know no one but Monsieur de Treville, he asked. Yes, monsieur, I know only him. Well, but then, continued Athos, speaking half to himself, if I kill you, I shall have the air of a boy-slayer. Not too much so, replied D'Artagnan, with a bow that was not deficient in dignity, since you do me the honor to draw a sword with me while suffering from a wound which is very inconvenient. Very inconvenient, upon my word, and you hurt me devilishly, I can tell you. But I'll take the left hand. It is my custom in such circumstances. Do not fancy that I do you a favor. I use either hand easily, and it will be even a disadvantage to you. A left-handed man is very troublesome to people who are not prepared for it. I regret I did not inform you sooner of this circumstance. You have truly, monsieur, said D'Artagnan, bowing again, a courtesy, for which, I assure you, I am very grateful. You confuse me, replied Athos, with his gentlemanly air. Let us talk of something else, if you please. Ah, blood! how you've hurt me! My shoulder quite burns. If you would permit me, said D'Artagnan, with timidity. What, monsieur? I have a miraculous balm for wounds, a balm given to me by my mother, and of which I have made a trial upon myself. Well? Well, I'm sure that in less than three days this balm would cure you, and at the end of three days, when you would be cured, well, sir, it would still do me a great honor to be your man. D'Artagnan spoke these words with a simplicity that did honor to his courtesy, without throwing the least doubt upon his courage. Pardieu, monsieur, said Athos, What? that's a proposition that pleases me, not that I can accept it, but a league off it savors of the gentleman. Thus spoke and acted the gallant knights of the time of Charlemagne, in whom every cavalier ought to seek his model. Unfortunately, we do not live in the times of the great emperor, we live in the times of the cardinal, and three days hence, however well the secret might be guarded, it would be known. I say that we were to fight, and our combat would be prevented. I think these fellows will never come. Uh, if you are in haste, monsieur, said D'Artagnan, with the same simplicity with which a moment before he had proposed to put him off for the duel for three days. And if it be your will to dispatch me at once, do not inconvenience yourself, I pray you. There is another word which pleases me, said Athos, with a gracious nod to D'Artagnan, that did not come from a man without heart. Monsieur, I love men of your kidney, and I foresee plainly that if we don't kill each other, I shall hereafter have much pleasure in your conversation. We will wait for these gentlemen, so please you, I have plenty of time, and it will be more correct. Ah, here is one of them, I believe. In fact, at the end of the street, the gigantic Porthos appeared. What? cried D'Artagnan. Is your first witness Monsieur Porthos? Yes, that disturbs you? By no means. And here is the second. D'Artagnan turned in the direction pointed to by Athos and perceived Aramis. What? cried he, in an accent of greater astonishment than before. Your second witness is Monsieur Aramis? Doubtless. Are you not aware that we were never, ever seen without the others, and that we are called among the musketeers and the guards at court and in the city, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, or the three inseparables? And yet come as you do from Dax or pa from Tarbes, said D'Artagnan. It is possible you are ignorant of this little fact, said Athos. My faith, replied D'Artagnan, you are well named. Gentlemen, my adventure. 
If it should make any noise, we'll prove at least that your union is not founded upon contrasts. In the meantime, Porthos had come up, waved his hand to Athos, and then turning toward D'Artagnan, stood quite astonished. Let us say, in passing, that he had changed his baldric and relinquished his cloak. Ah, he said, <laughs> what does this mean? This is the gentleman I'm going to fight with, said Athos, pointing to D'Artagnan with his hand and saluting him with the same gesture. Why, it is him I am also going to fight, said Porthos. Uh, but not before one o'clock, replied D'Artagnan. And I also have to fight with this gentleman, said Aramis, coming in his turn into the place. But not until two o'clock, said D'Artagnan, with the same calmness. What are you going to fight about, Athos, said Aramis. Faith, I don't know very well. He hurt my shoulder. And you, Porthos? Faith, I'm going to fight, because I'm going to fight, answered Porthos, reddening. Athos, whose keen eye lost nothing, perceived a faintly sly smile pass over the lips of the young Gascon as he replied, We had a short discussion upon dress. And you, Aramis? asked Athos. Oh, ours is a theological quarrel, replied Aramis, making a sign to D'Artagnan to keep secret the cause of their duel. Athos, indeed, saw a second smile on the lips of D'Artagnan. Indeed, said Athos. Uh, yes, a passage of St. Augustine, upon whom which we could not agree, said the Gascon. Decidedly, this is a clever fellow, murmured Athos. And now you are assembled, gentlemen, said D'Artagnan. Permit me to offer you my apologies. At this word, apologies, a cloud passed over the brow of Athos. A haughty smile curled the lip of Porthos, and a negative sign was the reply of Aramis. Oh, you do not understand me, gentlemen, said D'Artagnan, throwing up his head, the sharp and bold lines of which were at the moment gilded by a bright ray of the sun. I asked to be excused, in case I should not be able to discharge my debt to all three, for Monsieur Athos has the right to kill me first, which must much diminish the face value of your bill, Monsieur Porthos, and render yours almost null, Monsieur Aramis. And now, gentlemen, I repeat, excuse me, but on that account only, and on garde! At these words, with the most gallant air possible, D'Artagnan drew his sword. So, forgive the length of this passage, but I read it out in order to demonstrate possibility number two. Have you gleaned what I might be hinting at? Well, to not keep you in suspense if you have not, we could assume, we could propose, that the reason why the characters have no fear mechanic the characters are not shattered by horror, is that indeed they are already mad. They are cultists of the cause of chivalry. They are fanatical adherents to a time which has passed, which had faded from view before they were born. And they're operating in a world that makes no sense, where their ideals, where their values where the very fiber of their being is in sharp contrast to the realities that they face. They are strangers in a strange land. They are men out of time. And so, they will not change. They will not bend nor break, because that is the value that they hold before themselves as a guiding light. And if the reality that they face should snuff them out, then so be it. But those who observe their passing will note the bright light of their passage, and they will leave a mark on the world, and maybe they will change it. You have been listening to the Casting Shadows podcast. Our topic today was a framework or a philosophy for incorporating fear in heroic games, such as swashbuckling or adventure games, where there is no mechanical support for enforcing or requiring fear but yet play can be enhanced by its inclusion from a role-playing perspective nonetheless. 
I hope you've enjoyed this podcast and I look forward to interacting with listeners in the future. This podcast is recorded on Anchor and voice messages are available for those who listen to it there. If you listen to it through some other provider, you can reach me through other means available on my various social media outlets. If you're someone who uses Facebook, you can find me at facebook.com slash runeslinger. Through YouTube at youtube.com slash runeslinger. Twitter, twitter.com slash runeslinger. And for the podcast, well, you're already listening to it, as we said in the introduction. And so, until next time, take care.